the good news is we're all in this together and when we see we're together Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. <laughs> he always says in the flesh. I didn't say it today. <laughs> but today I, I, I got you skunked. Um, <clears throat> and this show is based on my blog, which is geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. I get news uh, on a daily basis. I post 10 to 15 items every day. <clears throat> that relate to energy and climate change. And then once a week, Tom and I get together and do the best of the blog, as it were. As it were. As it were. But today I'm gonna to start out with this. I'm gonna hold that up against my beard. A little, so little surprise, a little different for me. Well, this is day. a computer. It's, you know, I've had Raspberry Pi. Wish Pi's. we could zoom in on that. I, <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, you gotta get up and do it. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> try. But the, the, um, the uh, uh, Raspberry Pis that I've had were newer it's than this. It's Pi like in 3.1416. That's right. It's Pi. <laughs> <clears throat> this particular computer, which is actually about as powerful as my 8 or 10-year-old deck computer. This one is, is a 4-year-old design, and it uh, costs $20 new. When I was in college, it would take a, a two-story building to, yeah, to, well, to put what's in that. I, you know, the first computer I, I, first time I worked with a computer, yeah, th that computer, the the this little guy here. Let me get it out. This little guy, that's a sixteen gigabyte hard drive. <laughs> and that first it's a quarter the size of a postage stamp. Yeah, a small and postage that, stamp. That thing, and this, by the way, does have something to do with energy. Even even though this thing only draws three quarters of a watt. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, the point here is this thing is so powerful compared to the first personal computer I had. It's, it's probably about 100,000 times as powerful. And, <laughs> and, um, and it has, you know, 16 gigabytes as opposed to 16 kilobytes. So it's a million times as much memory. <laughs> and it costs $20.00. In, in, 19, in 2018, you, you can still buy these things new. They have not, Raspberry Pi is interesting because when the new models come out, they don't reduce the price of the old deal. ones. Yeah. But they still f sell them. And there are reasons to buy the old ones. You know, the, like for example, the newer ones, the newest two versions uh, can overheat, which the previous version can't. And I use the previous version, the Model 2B, for for the work that I do online, and it's the Model 3B is noticeably faster, but not much. Just about the quarter the size of a pack of cigarettes. Yeah, although what I'm going to do here, Tom, why don't you put both of us up? Um, I'm going to put. Ow! I'm, I'm going to yeah. use. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this thing during the show, unless something goes wrong. And uh, so what I'm going to uh, we have magic here. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, this little this little computer. Why don't you put both of us up again? It'll show it. Um, this little computer is a 32-bit machine, which is running the um, the uh, um, program that uh, that I read stuff from, which is LibreOffice, uh, uh, the the writing thing. The equivalent of Word. It's the equivalent of Microsoft yeah. Word, but LibreOffice is a free part of the operating system, which is called Raspbian, which is free. So it comes built in. It comes built yeah. in. You have to have an <laughs> SD card in order to run this stuff, but the SD cards range from 10 to $20. And now I've got this thing up, I can, I can, I can uh, read from it. The, the um, there we go. The, uh, 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 all right. Let's do a zoom. I want to increase the zoom. There we go. Okay, there we go. The, the, the point of bringing this thing in is to revisit Wright's Law, which 
it was is a e law of economics that they came up with in the 1930s. A guy, a guy named Wright developed it, and it says when you build things more and more and more and more of them, that you your experience in, increases, 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 and that means the things are better and they're cheaper. And with computers, that has meant that this little guy, which is probably 20,000 times as fast as my first personal computer and has about a million times as much memory as the first computer <laughs> I worked with, literally yeah, a million yeah. times as much memory, when you consider the SD card, um, it costs $20. You can buy it for twenty dollars. Yeah. You can buy a better machine that's faster, and, and for five dollars, <laughs> if you're, or or you can get it with something that doesn't have, which is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in for ten dollars, or you can buy what I would recommend, which would be one of the Model Three Bs or Model Two Bs. I use a Model Two B because it doesn't overheat. And um, they cost $35, but they have blue, all that stuff built in, and they have four <laughs> USB ports. And this thing I like because the USB and HDMI ports are full size, which makes cabling easier. And besides, it's cute. It's what? Cute. Yeah. Now, Wright's Law, same thing applies to solar power. Back in 1995 or 90, so, I, um, the, the boss in the research department where I was, working on computers said this architecture that we've got has, has to change. It cannot, it cannot get any faster because the distance from the, from the memory to the CPU slows it down mm -hmm. because it's getting, we're hitting against the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what are we going to do? Are we up against a wall? And he said, no, we're going to move the memory onto the chip, onto the CPU chip. Okay. And this thing <laughs> has got a single core. It's the most primitive of all the Raspberry Pi chips, but it's got a single core 32-bit uh, processor, which has 512 megabytes of RAM, also on the same thing, and it's also got a graphics unit and a floating point unit all built in, and I'm going to guess that it's a little bit less than half an inch square. Incredible. Yeah, isn't it? Incredible. Okay. And in 10 years, we're going to be saying, wow, and how, how could they live with something so big? Well, in 10 <laughs> years, we're also going to be saying, remember when solar power cost a dollar a watt? Yeah. yeah. And now, and when that happens, the electricity from solar power, well, the easiest way to, to distribute it would be to use it for free as a way of inducing people to, to uh, buy whatever product you've, you've got, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, raise the connect fee, sell the electricity for free. The idea of electricity that's too cheap to meter, we, didn't get, we didn't get there with, with <coughs> nuclear power, but we may with solar and wind. Okay, well, it's, we, it's here as far as it being too cheap, and the utility companies, some of them realize this, some of them don't. That's but right. But they're not in the business of providing electricity anymore. They're providing the, stick, the, the sticks and, and the, the, the strings, S sticks the and wires strings. And, and the telephone and the poles. Telephone poles yep. <clears throat> okay. They're in the distribution business now. Right. We have to move ahead or we're going to have items here that are left off. Well, And our first item here is from Clean Technica. Let's bring up a picture here. A pitcher. Let's have a pitcher. <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which mouse do I need to use? Here we go. We got a picture coming up. There you go. This that is, is a piece of nano wood. Yeah, what's the title of the article, Tom? New material made from wood is biodegradable super insulation. Now, if you look at that picture, you'll see that on the left side, there, there is a, a little bit there that's left from a sawing that broke. That was cut with a circular saw. You can see, you can mm -hmm. see the little, and you can see that there are there are striations in there that are that relate to the grain of the wood. Mm -hmm. Researchers at the University of Maryland claim to have found a way to strip away lignin and hemicellulose from wood. They say that the result, which they call nano wood, costs less and has insulating pro pro qualities that are superior to many insulation materials commonly used in the building industry today. And nano wood is stronger. 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 Because the article didn't mention anything about the structural properties of this. They were talking about this insulation property. 
Well, they they aren't building with this, but they're. I think the article did well, say. Well, it's that just it, what the article was talking about. It's certainly about. stronger than um, than uh, uh, than fiberglass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, well, they didn't even touch that. I mean, okay. it, I was just wondering, you know, why is it all about insulation? And it's a very superior insulation. It's a superior let me let me uh, read something from the yeah, article. Okay. Two years ago, they meaning the. Uh, University of Maryland uh, scientists yep. found a way to make wood transparent so it would be used as a substitute for glass. I don't <laughs> even remember that one. <laughs> now there's insulation for buildings that does a better job of lowering heating and cooling costs while being biodegradable when the useful life of these buildings is over. Yep. Okay, they can re reuse it or whatever. <laughs> After the lignin and hemicellulose are removed, the micro channels that allow sap to travel from the roots to the leaves of the trees remain. And they're so full of air. That's what's going on. That's, that's the insulation. They're the insulation. They act as tiny air-filled insulating barriers. Yep. When reduced to the thickness of a, to a, to, when reduced in thickness to a few millimeters, the material can be rolled up or shaped to conform to pipes or other non-rectilinear shapes. Yep. This is going to revolutionize building. It, it might. Oh, it will. Well, I'm, I'm, th I'm wondering where all the wood is going to come from. Anyway, we should we have to move quickly through these yeah, because let's, we've let's talk quick. talked about computers <laughs> a lot. Okay, the next item is from Solar Builder. Solar saves carbon faster, more effectively than nuclear power. By the way, I had a real difficult time pulling this Getting one. Getting this one? Oh dear. Yeah, yeah. Renewable electricity, <laughs> chiefly from wind and solar power, adds electric generation and saves carbon faster than nuclear power does or ever has, according to a data-rich new study by Amory Lovins and three colleagues at the Rocky Mountain Institute. If you can't get this, I would imagine you should be able to from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Yeah. I would hope. Uh, I wound up with the exact page that I was supposed to get. Ah. But... Uh, how you got there, you I, don't know. I, well, I, I just took the beginning sentence and Googled the whole uh -huh, sentence. Okay. The peer-reviewed scientific paper, this peer-reviewed scientific paper, yep. rebuts prior analyses claiming that nuclear power deploys, which means coming into a position ready for use, by the way. Yeah. I didn't even know what that meant. I thought it had to do with armies. <laughs> it does, Fast, actually, It deploys but... faster than renewable power. And that's just not true. And that nuclear growth would be a vital way to protect the climate. But renewable growth is inadequate. That's it's that's been wrong. rebutted. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we should move on. Move on. I, we've got an item here from factcheck.org. And they did fact check. Yes. Wind energy's carbon footprint. That's the title. U.S. Ener Interior Secretary Ryan Zink or Zinka, or Zinke, I don't know how it's pronounced, claimed the, the carbon footprint on wind energy is significant, but wind power's carbon footprint is among the smallest of any energy source. The carbon footprints of coal and natural gas are close to 90 and 40 times respectively. The US DOE's National uh, Energy, uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory is the source of this information. Well, this guy Zeki is not too much in favor of renewable energy. Nobody in <laughs> nobody in Washington is. They were all put there by people who. I mean, it's, they, they analyzed his speech, and this is fact check. Okay, yeah. so they're going through his speech, and he said, Zeki also said we probably chop up as many as seven hundred fifty thousand birds a year with wind. Okay, well, they do chop up a few birds with wind, but nowhere near seven hundred fifty thousand. Yep. yep. In 2016, the Bureau of Land Management found that oil fields could be killing up to a million birds a year. But Zinke doesn't say anything about that. But even oil fields pale in comparison to domestic cats, which scientists estimate kill billions of birds billions a year. Billions of birds, yeah. Okay, we're up to February 16th, Friday. And we have an oh, item here from MassLive.com. This, this is a biggie. I'm glad That's, the picture's The picture's up. already up there. That is in Massachusetts. That, by the way, is a wave hitting a seawall, and there's a there's some distance between the seawall and the buildings. That's Lynn, Massachusetts. Lynn, Massachusetts. By the way, this is a this is a, a big article. This is a good it's article. A big article. There's a 50 picture gallery yes. of this storm yes. in the Boston yes. area, and, and it's scary. By the way, as we're talking, we're having the fourth nor'easter in three weeks. 
it's not affecting us locally in Brattleboro, but it's, it's, but it's coming. just yep. hammering southeastern Massachusetts. And two of them were billed as, million, as thousand year storms. Really? Well, the reason they're happening, of course, according to climatologists, is because the, the Arctic regions are too warm. Yeah, we talked about that on the yeah. show. Okay. So, Storms focus <clears throat> attention on climate change. Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, I'm sorry, yes, that's right, I, I had it right, released a $1.4 billion bond bill that would authorize spending on climate change preparedness and environmental protection. The bill provides $300 million to respond to the impacts of climate change, including $170 million to repair dams and seawalls and help coastal communities. Well, it's a big <coughs> bill. Yes, it and is. And I'm looking at this thing and I say, is Governor Baker running for re-election? Because <laughs> this know. is not a law yet. This, this is just his proposal. That's right. But it is a good proposal. Yeah, and we need to, we need to work on this. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this, the city of, uh, of uh, um, which city in Florida? Um, Miami. Miami. Yeah, you're right. Miami. They're having city problems. of Mi Mi Miami is is spending close to half a billion dollars. They're having big problems. And that's just one city. Yeah. And Boston has got problems. And Boston is just one of many coastal communities in in Massachusetts. Well, if you look at the map of, of Boston itself, it's surrounded by all these small communities. I mean, we know the names of all of them. Lynn Mass is just one of them. Yeah. By the way, from the pictures, Lynn seems to be a very pretty town. Yeah. It's on a seacoast. I saw waves like that, but taller, when I lived in Plymouth, and they were they were being blown when they got up. The tops of them were being blown over the buildings and into parking lots on the other side of the buildings, where the salt water came down on cars. Well, you'll see if you look those. at the gallery there, you'll see exactly <coughs> that. I mean, it, it's yeah, it's kind of scary. It is. It's quite scary. Okay, Augusta Free Press is next. Groups sue for information about the Heartland Institute's involvement in EPA climate science decisions. The Southern Environmental Law Center and Environmental Defense Fund are suing the EPA for failing to release information about the Heartland Institute's efforts to attack climate science. Officials at the Heartland Institute, a promoter, a promoter of climate denial, publicly stated that EPA requested their assistance in a review of climate science. I looked up, I didn't know anything about the Heartland Institute, so I looked them up and uh, Wikipedia came up with what I am about to read. A conservative libertarian public policy think tank. In the 1990s, Heartland worked with Philip Morris to question or deny the health risks of secondhand smoke and to lobby against smoking bans. After 2000, they became a leading supporter of climate change denial. It rejects the scientific consensus on global warming and said that policies to fight it would be damaging to the economy. Yeah, well, That's Wikipedia. <coughs> the Heartland Institute is funded by the same people who fund the State Policy Network and who fund the American Legislative Exchange Council and who fund Freedom Partners. And Freedom Partners is the organization which in January of 2015 Stay, stated we're putting $889 million into the upcoming 2016 election so we can get control or our guys can get control of the Congress, both houses, and the White House. And they run away. Well, they got control of the yeah, Congress yeah. And, the, and, the, and the the two houses of Congress. They didn't get control of the White House because nobody's got control of Donald Trump. Not even <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> Not even Donald Trump. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> Our next item is from the New Hampshire. So this is the Koch brothers you're talking about. It's yep. the Koch brothers, yeah, and the and the uh, Mercers, and you know, there's, there's about, a bunch of them. There's about 300 yeah. people involved in this, uh, from what I've read. Okay, our next item is the, from the New Hampshire Business Review. New Hampshire Senate votes to expand net metering to larger users. This this is this is a good article. Yeah, it's a good thing. It is. The New Hampshire Senate passed a bill allowing larger businesses to get into net metering. The bill would increase fivefold the size of net metered systems from one megawatt, perhaps the size of a mid-sized store or town mall, to five megawatts, which might be used by f facilities like those of BAE Systems or FOSS Manufacturing. So, so reading into this, I looked this, this thing up. Yep. 
To get a, a, a megawatt, you're going to need about four acres of panels. Yeah. To get five megawatts, you're going to need 20 acres. Yeah. And that's not outlandish. It's not outlandish. And, you know, we could talk about the fact that a lot, when you put up large things like this, a lot of it goes on, of these large systems go on agricultural land. And people, so you get dual purpose <coughs> land you can use. A lot of people yeah. get upset about that because they think of it as being something that excludes agriculture. But it doesn't. But it doesn't, no. It does you got to You've got to think about what you're growing. But, uh, Absolutely. There's and if some, you're, some pro crops that grow very well in the shade. And there are crops that don't. Yeah. Conventional corn being you're one You're not going to do corn. And that's a good thing for people who are neighbors of conventional cornfields because they are toxic waste dumps that have yeah, GMO products <laughs> and they have all kinds of herbicides, pesticides, you name it, sides, stuck on there. And, you know... I'd, I'd much rather have sheep grazing under solar panels, which they seem to do quite happily. Okay, we're up to Saturday, yeah, February 17th. We've got a picture coming up We have here. a picture yeah, of, a, of an open pit mine. That picture is from 2004. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second, but let's read the headline. Yeah. Plans for the largest solar project in Washington State at the site of a former coal mine. This is from the Olympian. The former coal si uh, site of a coal mine could be producing solar power by the end of 2020. Plans were unveiled by electric provider TransAlta for a, a mine shutdown in 2006. Reclamation work has, had begun the following year to restore it to forest and pasture land, but now TransAlta believes it, it is a prime location for a new solar project. And yeah, you know, bring the picture back. Huh? I'm going to bring the picture back. Yeah. This picture was taken in 2004. Four, yes. When the mine was still actively mining right. coal. And you can see the coal yeah. in, in the field there. Yeah. Uh, in 2005, they closed it. It's been re replanted and returned to pasture. And now they're looking at it again and they're saying, hey, you know, guys, this would be a good place to put solar panels. Right. And, you know, they, they, they talk about re restoring these things to, um, to forest. And from what I've read... Well, it was pasture that they retorted this yes, one to. Yes, this one. From what I've read, almost none of them is restored to forest. And the reason is because what they do before they go out is they measure the soil in various places, and they have to put that much soil back. Oh. <laughs> and the places that they measure are very often the high places where yeah. the soil is like half an inch thick yeah. that won't provide support for trees unless the unless the ground is very uneven and the soil can build up in places so i this one is being what was being restored to meadow and i think with solar panels it could still be meadow this is going to be a big project yes the solar is. farm will occupy close to a thousand acres you know i'll just There's think a about, lot of land at this mine yeah, site just think about the the that pit being a thousand acres and that's by no means by the way if you want i'm going to pull a picture up a second here. okay if you look in that picture, yeah, there's these little tiny dot-like things in the picture. Yes. They are these huge trucks that are about three stories tall. Yeah. So this picture was taken from far away. It was taken from an airplane. Yes, it was. <laughs> okay. Wow. We have an item from KT Press. Well, this is a very interesting article. It is. I think this is a great article. In it, it is indeed, yes. Local entrepreneur lights a village in R Rwanda. And my takeaway right off of that, if they can do this in R Rwanda, they we can, can do, it do it this anywhere. in Vermont. Some Rwandans in remote areas of the country have decided not to wait for the government to provide them with electricity. Instead, they invested in, and you know that they didn't have to invest much because they didn't have much off-grid energy to change the lives of their villages. One village will soon bid farewell to darkness thanks to a hydropower project that was designed by a local entrepreneur and built by local people. I got some pictures, I wish I could bring them up. Yeah. They're showing these, pick these people, well, I'm gonna bring us up first. Yeah. They're showing these people building this dam. Yeah. It's not poured concrete. It's no, a it's brick stone. wall, a stone wall. <laughs> yes. There's about 100 people working on yeah. it. It's the industri prior to the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, and it's These also guys are doing it themselves. Yeah, and the, it's like and a barn raising. Yes, and it's not, it's not deep. You know, I looked at no, that and I thought... No, it's not. It's shallow. 
wow, that thing could just get blown apart because, by pressure because it's so weakly constructed. It's constructed out of stone, but that's not how you build dams. And then I thought, but the thing's only about eight feet tall. It's actually more than that, but it's it's like about twelve. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very big. low pressure that we've got on, that they've got on this thing, and if it's if it's sufficiently thick, it's not. I got a quick takeaway from this guy. This is yeah. the, this is the guy talking. His name is Israel something or other. <laughs> He's not Jewish. No, <laughs> I was fed I was, up with seeing my vis my village in darkness while other villages near tarmac roads nearby have electricity. I thought about a project that could get this community out of darkness. It all started in 2011 when Isra this is a guy, Israel, Israel Habibamana, began buying used engines and water pipes and assembling them to make an 11 kilowatt hydropower plant. The plant will light 141 households and 19 businesses and is going to cost 72 million Rwanda francs, <laughs> which is $85,000. Yeah. Okay. And this guy, Habimana, is financing the project himself through his brick-making business. There you go. Bingo. Yeah. If, if they can do it, we can do it. Absolutely. And like okay. I said, it reminds me of a, of a barn raising, you know, the community get together to do something. Absolutely. Okay. Let's move along. I've got a picture here. This uh, is a, we've got an item from the South China Morning right. Post. And this is a solar panel arrange, arrangement in China. In China. China's solar panel industry faces a year of reckoning amid global protectionism. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about this we later. We are indeed. Uh, Chinese suppliers of solar panels may be facing epic headwinds in the year ahead as rising production capacity is set to coincide with growing trade protectionism in the United States and India and a downturn in domestic demand. Chinese solar manufacturing supplied 55 to 83 percent, and this is depending on what technology you're talking about, 55 to 83 percent of global demand for various solar products last year. Well, they exported 40 gigawatts of solar panels last year. Wow. Okay, 37, that's 30% 30 of global total. Yeah. Okay, up to 80% from, up 80% from 2016, so it has been growing. They've been, their solar okay. has been growing like crazy. So Access to the U.S. market has come into question since the Trump administration announced a 30% tariff on solar panel imports with China, while India had discussed a 70% duty. Yeah. Threatening access to the world's second most populous market, which now, is India. Here. Here's the interesting thing about that tariff. Yeah. It is not being put in place because of any claim that the Chinese were, were dumping products or, or, or illegally supporting products or whatever. It, it's being put in place for only one reason, which is that American manufacturers are not competitive with Chinese manufacturers and in so making the panels in making the panels and so they need protection because they're not competitive and he, there's only two significant well, manufacturers there's there's other manufacturers but the and there's American two that home. are suffering there's two that they're doing this for yeah. and what that does though is it means that the American manufacturers are being um, uh, can be competitive in the United States but nowhere else. That doesn't make sense. That's what they're doing, <laughs> because yeah. the Chinese can sell these things anywhere that, where the, they're not protected, and the Indians are calling into question whether they're going to uh, protect themselves from Chinese panels or not. Yeah. Okay. I can see the Indians wanting to protect their own industry. Yeah, But absolutely. I don't think they're going about it right. I don't think so. Okay, we're up to Sunday, February 18th, and we have an item oh, from we, Zinhua. Yeah, we are. Yeah, here we go. Conservatives win South Australian state election after 16 years in opposition. And we've talked about these we guys have. on the show. In fact, last week we said we're going to be seeing something about this. The conservative, and the, this is small case conservative, <laughs> they are conservative people, but they're not called the conservative party. They're called the party. liberal party. They're called the liberal party. <laughs> that makes the sense. The conservative <laughs> liberal party has won the election in South Australia state, ending the Australian Labor Party's streak of 16 years of, uh, in power in the state, Along with promises of tax cuts for small businesses, the new pre, uh, Premier Marshall's campaign promised to scale back the Australian Labor Party approach to renewable energy, which he describes as reckless. And by the way, yeah. they had a citizen's reaction to that statement of his that was so strong they? that they had to back off on it 
immediately. I'll be darned. Yeah. Well, it's, this goes kind of in opposition to what we've been talking about on a show. Now, Absolutely. Maybe we've been getting misinformation, or maybe this article's misinformed. I don't well, know. The, article is, the article is correct um, as far as it goes. Yeah, the article technically was, correct. The article was produced within 24 hours of the election, and, of course, the citizen feedback has had its effect since then. So we've got to see how it, how it churns out. Yeah, we do. Okay, we've got an, um, an item coming up now from 89.3 KPCC. My guess is that must be an AM radio station. I would say that it is. <laughs> I would say that it is. One of the I things I love about... I think about, we've got a picture coming We do. Up. It's, it's already up on the, on the, what do they call it when, in baseball? The on deck circle. On deck circle. Here That's we go. Right. Um, the, I love these radio stations because they never protect their sites. You know, there's no paywall on radio. Yeah, yeah. Or they, want, they want you to look at it. They want you to look at it, absolutely. So it makes it much, my job much easier. Okay. Former coal lobbyists could get EPA's number two job. This is typical of the way Washington's running. Uh, President Trump's nominee for deputy, deputy administrator of the EPA, Andrew Weber, Wheeler, I'm sorry, Andrew Wheeler, has spent much of his career working for less oversight for the agency. He is a longtime aide to Senator James Inhofe, known for his climate-denying antics on the, sol on the Senate floor. After that job, Wheeler became a lobbyist for the fossil fuels industry. Well, Inhofe is the snowball guy. Yeah, he's the snowball guy. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy, Wheeler, helped defeat a 2008 climate bill before leaving. Since 2009, he's represented the interests of some of the largest fossil fuel companies in the U.S. Right. This experience will serve Wheeler well as, his, as deputy administrator, his supporters argue, as the EPA continues to roll back Obama-era rules and regulations and the agency works more closely with industry. Take, I'll go back and look at the mine again. Yeah. This is a brand new mine. In Pennsylvania. Yes. And it's, it's only been open for a couple of months. Newly opened. And you, will, you might notice the electric, the American flag lying on the ground. <laughs> yes, if I did. If you've been in the Boy Scouts, you know that's a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a patriotic American, you don't let the American flag touch the ground. And these people, you know, they claim to be patriotic, but oh well. Okay, should we move on? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Sweden to Sweden. Sweden happy to help on North Korea. North Korea is, and this is from the Straits Time, which is not Sweden. So I said, Sweden? That's Malaysia. The Straits of Malacca, <laughs> isn't it? It's yeah. like Singapore. It's, yeah, yeah that, that area. Uh, North Korea's uh, foreign minister went to Sweden, prompting speculations about a meeting between U.S. President Trump and Mr. Kim Jong-un, leader of North Korea. <coughs> Excuse me. Sweden is happy to help resolve tensions on the Korean peninsula arising from the North Korean construction of a nuclear reactor and pursuit of nuclear military power. We don't hear this much, but Sweden <coughs> has had long-standing ties with North Korea. Yeah. And they're trying to kind of patch things up. I think they're doing a good job. They're trying they, to yeah, do a good they're, job. They're trying to defuse a... Potentially very pot dangerous pot situation. Potentially dangerous situation. But the United States is, is acting in a way which is very hostile to, to, to China. And yes, as, it is. <coughs> as long as the United and States... China's doing, pretty scary, really. China they they have a, potential that we can't even imagine. Yeah, they have the biggest economy on Earth. Yes, it's by bigger, a long shot. bigger than the United States economy. A lot of Americans don't realize that. It's not as big in terms of, of um, gross domestic product per person but it's got a bit bigger gross domestic pro product for the country, and it is way out ahead of the United States in a bunch of different areas. For example, I got a note from, from uh, Proterra, which is the biggest manufacturer of electric buses in the United States. They have yeah. sold 575 buses. That's nothing. In the last three years, the Chinese have sold 300,000 of them. Okay, that's something. <coughs> and 
you know, I mean, the Chinese... Electric buses make sense, too. Electric buses save enough money over diesel. They cost 60% more, but they will make that up in six years. And I did see an article where the uh, bus stops yeah. have magnets, mag magnetic coils built into the ground yeah. that when the bus stops there to pick up passengers, it's getting the batteries recharged. I'm, I'm just wondering what that's <laughs> going to do to human health, but, you know, who knows? Well, we've had wires in our walls since we've for over a hundred years. We've had wires in our walls, but those those wires buried at bus stops are going to be pretty powerful. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Um, certainly, this is an interesting article. Let's get a picture up. Which one is that? The Union of Grass Valley. The the yeah, yep. Nevada Fairgrounds. I thought this is a really interesting picture. This, I thought this was a great article. This picture, by the way, was taken. You can see from the from the um, from the shadows. It was taken very close to sundown. And um, the, so the solar array there is not in the sun, but it would be when, when the time comes. And that's just a demonstration. And the thing that I'll point out there is that that solar array is built leaning against a shipping crate. Yep, and the that shipping, it comes in. That it comes in. <laughs> So everything is, it's a, it's a power system in a box. That, that's great. That, that is real. This is a great article. This I is, love this. Yeah, Union of Grass Valley. Well, let me, let me give you the, the uh, headline. Title, yes. What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> Worldwide, 1.2 billion people have little or no access to electricity. A man in Grass Valley, Nevada, is on a mission to help solve the world poverty crisis. Angelo Campos, or Angelo Campos, is the CEO of Box Power Incorporated, a startup company that provides off-grid communities with affordable microgrid systems in shipping containers. So you I hope bring the guy's not in Nevada because Grass Valley's in California. I've been there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very close to Nevada. I thought I looked. I thought I looked. It's that in up. Nevada County, of California. Oh, <laughs> you know that's my fault. I, I, um, oh. Yeah, it's Nevada County Fairgrounds. Yep, you're right. Absolutely <laughs> right. I saw Nevada, and I, I took, I just. Well, it's it's not, it's not ten miles from the the Nevada border. Yeah, you know? it's right well, there. Just means snowy. This is a good article. You read what you're going to say, and then I got a couple. Of I already here. read it. Oh, well, <laughs> twenty five year old and twenty five years old. This guy is. Yep. He's a he was a g child genius. Okay. I would guess. Angelo Campus is his name. He's the founder and CEO of Box Power and Quarter Incorporated, which is quite literally power in a box. The renewable energy startup company provides instant, affordable, portable microgrid infrastructures. You call them up in the morning and in the afternoon, you got power. And you know that box could be delivered by a helicopter if it had to be. If it had to be. Yeah. Inside each 20-foot shipping container is a 48-panel pre-assembled array, and that's it you're looking there at. There it is. Optional wind turbine unit on a tilt-up tower, <laughs> backup biodiesel fuel generator, and a battery bank for energy storage. It's essentially a plug-and-play hybrid energy system capable of powering 5 to 10 off-grid homes. Yeah. Five Brilliant. To, yeah, 5 and to 10. And what a thing for disasters. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Um, it, this is a this is a brilliant system. That this and of course there are other ways it could be put together. But he's got another market for this that I didn't even think of. Probably nobody did. Greenhouses. Yes. He's, there's a lot of big greenhouses that use a lot of power. Yeah. So he's promoting these things to those guys. Yes, absolutely. Okay. This guy's smart. We're going to hear more about him. We have got an item coming up from Clean Technica. We do, I guess. <laughs> we do, I guess. <laughs> I, don't I just don't have the name of the source. GE, this is an interesting article, too. GE aims coal-killing energy storage solutions at willing customers. The US DOE recently floated the idea of carving out a place for, a small, for small coal power plants in the distributed energy landscape of the future. But it looks like the agency's latest attempt to save coal is a day late and a dollar short. GE is pitching energy storage. Well, it's basically energy in a box again. You know? Yeah, they, absolutely. They call it the reservoir. <clears throat> yep. And they're going, they're going at it kind of slowly, but this is going to be big. It's going to be a something you can haul to a, to a site in a, tra in a box trailer yeah. overnight 
and yep. you got storage. And you've got storage. And then you can combine that to, with any renewable energy you've got. And one of the problems with these GE, with a coal killing, I mean, sorry, with a, what they call um, uh, small modular coal plants, which are obviously taken from small modular nuclear reactors, which people have been promoting for years. Yeah, we don't hear much about them. I think it's a, what would you call it, flesh in the pan. Well, I come across articles about them, and the articles basically all say the same thing. So I don't yeah. usually put post articles about them. Well, they're not making a big splash, right? They're they? not making a big splash yet. They might in five years. Uh-huh. Um, the... The um, small coal power plants, small modular coal po power plants, are um, to be preferred, the energy department says, because they ramp up quickly. Now, yeah. when you consider how big these things are and how big a conventional coal plant is, they will ramp up in, you know, maybe... Six hours? Ten hours. Ten hours. Twenty-four hours instead of instead of three days three days <laughs> and so what you know the fact is if you've got a battery and that you, ramps up like instantly it's like <laughs> wh why are you worried about the millisecond delay yeah you know so this is an interesting thing though they call it the reservoir yeah okay and the innards consist of a fairly standard lithium iron energy storage arrangement 1.2 megawatts and 4 megawatt hours okay it's not a lot different from what tesla's doing Yes, that's right. Okay, our next item is from, uh, oh, here we go. We've got a photograph. Yeah, we've got this a picture from, here. From Power Technology. Let's get the picture up there. Picture. And that's a big, that's a large <laughs> big solar, solar array. Yeah. I don't know where that one is. Uh, do you? I don't remember. Yeah, and I, I didn't record it. What's so. the title? Shell moves into renewables. Big splash or a dip in the water? Shell is taking tentative steps away from the oil and gas sector in which it has flourished for over a century and toward more renewables. In an effort to move toward less carbon intensive energy system, Shell has been investing in biofuels, carbon capture, capture and storage technologies, as well as green technologies such as uh, solar and wind. I think they're covering, the, covering their back they, here. They're covering, you know, uh, this carbon capture and storage I think is a, I think it's a fraud. Um, well, if it's not a fraud, it's a boondoggle. Okay, but it's <laughs> one way or the other. I just, I, I, I it, it isn't going to work. Long I don't term. think it's going to work long term. But it's the point here is that Shell is looking for markets that they have have um, that they can move to as they move away from oil. Well, and gas. The writing's on the wall. These guys aren't stupid. That's you right. Know, so they know yeah. what they're doing. Absolutely. And Shell isn't the only company making these changes. No, it's not. Many major oil and gas companies are staking similar claims to ensure they play a growing part in the renewable sector. Yep. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> BP is investing in solar. Yep. Dong, which we talked about, Danish oil and natural gas. Which is now Ersted. I was just going to say that it's transitioning entirely to a fully renewable company and rebranding re itself as Ersted. Now, an O with a slash going um, through it. Umlaut, yeah. <laughs> is, is a zero, isn't it? <laughs> People put a slash Yeah, yeah, zero. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> o only in Danish it isn't. It's a letter. Yeah, it's not an umlaut. It's a, a slash. Umlaut is a little two dots it's on top It's two dots it. above yeah. a German... It's, yeah. A, A, O, or U, not E or I. Okay. Uh, we have those in English, those two dots, over E's and O's, which are, which are to, they're just a symbol that says this is a different vowel than the preceding vowel. Yeah, well, instead vowel. of two E's going like feet, it's... It's, it's going to be two O's like cooperation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 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 Okay, we are up to Tuesday, February 20th, and, and we, we have a picture, a picture here. here. That's a nice ship. Oh, I love that one. I was on a destroyer for a while. Yeah, well, that's a Chinese destroyer. That's a, that's a, that's a sharp-looking ship. Yeah, but I don't you. think I'd want to serve in the Chinese Navy. Well, I don't think I would either. I'm getting a little old for that. I don't think they'd let me even if I did want to. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. So let's move along here. Uh, pull us up. Don't bet on a decline in Chinese solar PV production. We talked about this earlier. This is now later. Yes. Okay. China's, uh, the, it's China's initiative, which is called One Belt, One Road, 
is promising $1.2 trillion for struggling, struggling economies worldwide. One of the goals of the program is to marginalize American world interest uh, influence. The solar panels and other goods the U.S. has subject, subjected to a tariff are tools that the Chinese are using in this program. Well, this One Belt, One Road initiative is very big, and they're it, connecting China to Europe with a corridor. Yeah. Roads, rails. Uh, transmission the, lines. Transmission lines is what this article's about. Well, this article also goes into um, uh, I, the fact that the Chinese are extending their influence in South America, in the Caribbean, in Central America, in Africa, and what they have been doing is they've been loaning money to to, or to countries yeah. like Sri Lanka, and when the countries can't pay the bill, they take it over. They, they just say, "Okay, we'll take a port. Yeah, that's okay. And it, we'll use it for the navy. It, it'll be a, it'll be fine." Well, you know, between you, me, and the world, that's a little bit better than declaring war on them, isn't it? Well, it is. But <laughs> what it means is that, as the United States has said, we don't want to be involved in the rest of the world. Dominica, you get destroyed by a hurricane; it's your problem. The Chinese come to Dominica and say, oh yes, we can help you. And by the way, could we sign a military agreement? Yeah. And now the Chinese have got a military agreement with an island in the Caribbean. Yeah. And if that island borrows money and doesn't want to have the ability to repay it. They got a seaport. The Chinese got a seaport, which is close enough to... To the do United some nasty States. stuff if they want to. The, the Chinese are... are, are <laughs> They're pretty smart. They're very smart. They learned how to do this when they watched the British do it in Hong Kong. Well, I got a takeaway here that I'm going to read because it's good. Yeah. This article is about much more than solar panels. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I spelled very with three R's. Wow. We cannot be great. This is a quote. We cannot be great without providing world leadership. We cannot lead the world by refusing to engage. We have lost our leadership position when we abandoned the Paris Peace Accord. The, dis the U.S. has lost its place as the largest world economy. With help from Russia, we have allowed the whole concept of democracy to be discredited. And, and we are doing these things to maintain leadership and obsolete technologies for the sake of obsolete industries guided by obsolete interests. Now, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. Did it you is, notice, by the way, who wrote that article? I probably did, but I forgot. <laughs> you wrote it? Yes. Did you really? I wrote it, yeah. I'll be darned. Well, yeah. I write for Genius. Queen. Genius. Ah, <laughs> there you go. It, well, that's, you know, I'm the guy with the magic. You know, And I'm, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this <laughs> below because it's about the Silk Road, but it's about the power grid part Absolutely. Of it. Okay, our next item is also from Clean Technica, but I didn't write it. Okay, solar surprise. Small-scale solar, a better deal than big. This, this really is a surprise. This is, it yeah. It really is. It is. Except for one thing, and that is it's looking at things from a slightly different point of view. And the point of view that it's looking at is what does it cost the customer? Isn't that an interesting idea? What does it cost the customer? Well, yeah, the customer is benefiting from this, <laughs> and they haven't been calculating that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. For a public utilities... If, Commission eyeing the least cost of solar energy, the benefit, the greatest benefit, will be at a scale less than 10 megawatts to 20 megawatts, for a city or community looking to maximize the value of citizens' solar investment. Smaller systems are best, and the best systems are going to be the ones that you put on your own rooftop. And you take advantage of the electricity before the meter. So, That's right. So you're saving full cost. That's right. Yeah. Saving full cost. And, you know, there you go. Well, interesting <clears throat> here, what, a question here, and this is what they looked at. What is the value of local spending on distributed solar product yep. projects? Yeah, yeah. And when you count that in, it gives you a different picture. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technology News, and we have a picture on this. Got a picture here, yeah. yeah. Nice picture, too. Well, yeah, come on, guy. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> it is a nice picture. Yeah. It looks very serene. This is <clears> not <throat> uh, what they're talking about. This is No, it's not. Because there's a beach in the, in the foreground. That's right. And there's not too many this solar projects that you can see like this from a beach. Well, they call them near shore. Uh -huh. projects and they're also onshore which are basically on the beach 
And but, they're talking about Martha's Vineyard, and yeah. it, has, it isn't built yet. And it's not going to be visible like this. No, it's going to be 25 miles offshore. Yeah, you got to... You gotta, uh, NEC uh, Energy Solutions develop energy storage for 800-watt megashore offshore wind farm. Base state, megashore. Megashore. Megawatt. There you go. It's a megashore, farm. though. Bay State Wind signed a letter of intent to work with NEC Energy Solutions to develop an energy storage system for its 800 megawatt offshore wind farm. Massachusetts-based NEC Energy Solutions will develop a 55 megawatt, 111 megawatt hour storage system to support the proposed offshore, offshore wind farm off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. And they're partnering with that outfit we just talked about called <clears throat> Dong, now called Ersted. Ersted, right. And they're also, and this Eversource is New England's major transmission builder. So they they got some heavy heavy hitters here. Yep. Okay, we're up to Wednesday, February 11th, with an item from February New York. 11th. <laughs> Man, I'm March 21st. <laughs> Let's let's say it right from your active. Okay. Okay. On Wednesday, February eleventh, <laughs> EU study weighs linking power grid to China's energetic Silk Road. It's a continuation this of what is, we just this talked is, about. You know, I mean, the Chinese are so far ahead of America in this stuff. It's crazy. The European Union Scientific Research Center has explored the idea of linking power grids of Europe and China in order to tap the immense clean energy potential of the Middle Kingdom and countries in Central Asia, which means basically like possibly Russia, but certainly Mongolia. Oh, a yeah. study of, yeah. of the EU's Joint Research Center into a supergrid link has mapped three potential routes. Well, first thing I want to talk about is Middle Kingdom. Why do they call it the Middle Kingdom? Because it's at the center of the universe. Well, ultimately, yes, that's true. But uh, it happens that the Chinese don't call China, China. They call it the Middle Kingdom. They call it Zhangguo. I can't even say it. Zhangguo. Okay. And the translation of that is Middle, Middle Kingdom. Middle Kingdom. So and if you look at the characters that they use for that, yeah. they are literally Middle Kingdom and kingdom, okay. those two characters. Mm -hmm. Duh. Duh. <laughs> As opposed to Japan, which uses similar, the similar character for kingdom, but the character that it uses instead of middle is the character that's used for the sun and dawn. So okay. Japan is the dawn kingdom, okay. which is why it had that, that rising, rising sun, sun flag. Yeah. Yep, yep, you yep. See? Well, mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's an interesting article. And it's a hypothetical scenario that tries to back balance maximum renewable energy exploitation with avoiding conflict zones and harsh terrain. Yeah. They got three different ways to do it, and they're talking about the pluses and minuses of each of them. Of each three. one. And, and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a back story here that the, that the article really doesn't, doesn't address. Um, several years ago, I was working on some computer stuff and a colleague of mine in Massachusetts and I were talking on the phone and I had just come across an article talking about somebody wanting to build um, nuclear reactors on Hudson's Bay and not southern Hudson's Bay but way in the north. <clears throat> and I said, Don, why would anybody build a nuclear reactor on Good question. in the north of <laughs> Hudson's Bay? And he said, to supply electricity to New York City. Yeah. And just as an example. And I said, isn't that rather long distance for um, transmitting power? Not anymore. Not anymore. He, he gave me the name of a company that was, and I've forgotten the name of the company, but it was in Air, Massachusetts. And he said they had just received patents, which the Chinese were actively infringing on. And like mad actively infringing mm -hmm. on. Now, this is going back. I'm going to say to about 2010, about eight years ago, maybe nine years ago. But he said, this stuff is, it can transmit power over super long distances. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so at that point, I looked into it, found out what they were doing, found out what the old stuff was, looked into AC versus DC versus, you know, the, mm -hmm. all the rest of that. And what had happened, we've talked about this on the show, in the old days... Um, changing 
between voltages is fairly easy with AC and not oh, easy yeah, with DC. Oh yeah, absolutely. Tesla did that. So the deal is you're going to lose a certain amount of po of, of power over with a AC. certain distance with it's anything. Built in. Yeah, with but anything. It's worse, it's worse with AC. It's w worse with AC, and it's something that people who have 12 volt systems, DC systems in their households know about because they lose they voltage. They lose it. Yep. But the amount that you lose <clears throat> is not related to the voltage. Correct. It's related to, to the current. The you know, and so what happens is. If you up the voltage, a bigger percentage of it gets through. Bingo. Absolutely. And what happened was in the 19, early 1990s, they started figuring out how to switch voltage with DC. Well, new technology came along. New on technology board. came along. So I found a, a thing at the USDOE that said we lose 10%, we lose 9.5% of our power, of the, of the power and transmission. I'll give you 10. Every, every uh, 1,000 miles. And then I found another one that said, 1995, we lose 6% of our power every 1,000 miles. So we're getting somewhere. Getting somewhere. The technology had been changing. And at that rate, they could, they could transmit DC power cost-effectively 4,000 miles. Well, now they got these cryogenic systems where they can try, they, they could go almost anywhere with yeah. almost no losses. It's like three, two and a half percent of the, of, the, of the electricity is used to maintain the cryogenic mm -hmm. system, and the rest of it goes through. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have basically, you could, you could power any place on Earth from any place on Earth if you've got that line in there. Well, I foresee the Americas being independent. Yep. And all of that power is going to come from Canadian Hydro. Could be. There's a lot of There's potential lot. up there. Yep. Not just in Quebec, but all across northern Canada. Okay. We have two items left. We can do it. Uh, Clean Technica. I think. Has one about McDonald's. McDonald's becomes the first restaurant chain to set science-based greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. McDonald's? This is, in to this is important. <laughs> McDonald's? <laughs> well, they're doing it for... Public relations for sure, but they're benefiting from it. McDonald's, one of the planet's most recognizable co companies, has become the first restaurant chain in the world to set a greenhouse gas emissions reduction target approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Now, that approval is important. There have been other chains that have set theirs, but they haven't been approved. This goal is to reduce emissions by 36% at all McDonald's restaurants and offices by 2030 from a 2015 baseline. And by the way, that includes reduction in the greenhouse gases associated with their... With it's a supply chain. Supply chain, yep. which means they're going to have to start getting their, their products in a much more responsible fashion than they That's have That's exactly what's happening. Okay, we got a... One more look, item. And we got a picture coming We have a here. picture, and this is from Ars Technica. U.S. electricity use drops. Renewables push fossil fuels out of the mix. This is interesting. Yeah, it is. U.S. electric generation last year was down 1.5% from the year before, and that's despite an increase in the gross domestic product and the population. A drop of 105 gigawatt hours. But both coal and natural gas saw larger declines. Coal was down by 2.5%, uh, a smaller decline than it has seen recently, but coal's decline will continue. No new coal plants were opened last year, and 6.3 gigawatts of coal capacity were retired in 2017. And by the way, natural gas went down, I think it was 7%, roughly. Something like that, yep. Yeah. Well, these numbers indicate something must be displacing the use of fossil fuels. Yes. And that's something clearly not nuclear, <laughs> okay? Yes. So it leaves us with renewables. Yeah. Okay. And this is an aside, this has nothing to do with that, but it's good news. The return of a snowpack to California helped boost the production of hydropower. Yes, although we don't know how long that's going to last. No, but it's a plus. It is definitely a plus. We are at the end of our show. I think we are. And, and the fact that we did that magic act at the beginning <laughs> of the show meant that Time got warped a little bit, so we may be a few. We have to it. squeeze this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're talking real fast, roll and did something. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you'll tune in next time. <laughs>